watched the documentary about you that you shared on email. It's pretty cool. And I just want to say that I, you know, thank you. you doing your own thing on your own platform. Definitely respect the movement and very pleased to be chatting with you today. Wake up, God damn it. Body to this very iconic moment, as I stated on uh, Instagram. Um, I'm very honored and pleased to be sitting with a legendary icon, hip hop, of this movement that we've been a part of for so many years. And he's written books for Tupac, Jay-Z, and now he's penned a book for the legendary Nipsey Hussle. Uh, we're going to ask a bunch of questions about the book, the relationship of Nipsey. I want everybody to welcome legendary writer Rob Kenner. How you doing? I'm very well and blessed, Taj. Thanks for having me on the show, and um, I appreciate that intro. I'm going to try to live up to it. <laughs> doing a good, hey, you've already done a great job so far. I don't know what, what more you can do, but you've already done solidify your position as icon in this industry. Thank you. I just want to say you mentioned some books I worked on. I haven't done any on Jay yet, but he's in the Nipsey book and he's in the Biggie book. I, I worked on a book called Unbelievable, which was the um, first biography of Christopher Wallace, aka the Notorious B.I.G. So I was the editor of that and um, I worked with Cheo Hodari Coker, who is the author of it, and he went on to co-write the screenplay for the film notorious if you saw that um and now you know since, since yes. that he's gone on to do lots of other stuff in hollywood and you know cheo is a uh, big inspiration to me he's uh, he did the luke cage series on netflix and amazon uh pictures he's doing big things over there so you know but just to get the record straight um, no book on Jay yet, but I did have a big hand in the Biggie book, uh, Unbelievable. And today, you know, it's all about okay. the, the marathon don't stop, which, you know, um, yes, sir. It's been one week since we rolled this book out and the response has been overwhelming. And I appreciate you for reaching out to talk about it. Yeah, because, you know, um, I'm one of those people that came into Nipsey kind of late. But when I came into Nipsey, I was just blown away. So when I listened to the Victory Lap, I probably listened to that album every single day, all day long. And it, it, it made me go and listen to all the previous work. And and I I did not realize how much I've been slept, I slept on Nipsey. You know what I mean? His message has been consistent throughout his years of making music. He just started with Victory Lap. So I went back and listened to the entire catalog, and he's definitely um, a person that deserves all his roses and the respect that he's getting before and after he passed. Yeah, no doubt about it. I remember speaking with him. This was about six days after Victory Lap was released, and he had just come to New York to do his you know, NYC press run. And <clears throat> I said to him, one of the first things was like, it's so crazy to call this your debut album because you're like a dozen projects into your career, but it was the first official album on a major label. So that was everything else was considered a mixtape. Although if you listen to projects like the marathon and Crenshaw mailbox money, there's so many classic projects, but it's just like one album album. So, um, yeah, it, it, a lot of people, like yourself you know, yeah a, and so like i said where you know and they tap in now and like this like the book says the marathon don't stop and people just continue to discover him every day now with um what inspired you to want to do a book on nipsey was it your relationship with him um was it what was the inspiration behind um, the book well it was definitely just being privileged enough to meet him and, and feel his energy from very early. Like the first time I met Nipsey was in the offices of Vibe Magazine, the year was 2009, and he had come up to present his Bullets Ain't Got No Name mixtape to the staff of Vibe. And um, I had no idea who he was at that time. I'd never heard of him, um, but everyone who 
was in the room that day when he walked in remembers Nipsey Hussle. He just had an electricity is the best way I can describe it. He just had like charisma, personal, you know, magnetism. And you could just tell his mind was crackling, like just to be in that room and presenting his tape to, you know, a big magazine because, you know, uh, I found out later actually while researching the book, he had been sending his demo and headshot to the offices of Vibe, hoping for a look in our next section, which was like the new artists on the verge, um, you know, highlight. So people like Mary J. Blige and Nas and Biggie got their first look in next. So that's what he wanted, you know? And as I came to understand, he was getting a little bit frustrated because we weren't getting back to him. And, you know, like every other obstacle in his path, he just powered through it. You know, he stayed focused and by God, he made it up into the office of vibes. So, you know, I, I could feel he was a special person. The way he was flowing on that tape was incredible. Very refreshing to hear like some hard LA rap at that moment in time. If you remember 2009, it was more like dance records and, you know, do the stanky leg and that kind of thing. You know, right. that was cool, but Nip was giving you something very different and I enjoyed it. And I just, you know, expressed that to him, like, you know, we're going to try to give you whatever strength we can. This is 09 and we gave him one page and vibe. And, uh, you know, over the years, I just paid attention. I wasn't like a great friends with him or anything. I was just doing my job as a journalist watching his movement and you know the crenshaw cd selling that for a hundred dollars a copy was a total game changer like really literally changed the music <laughs> yeah i remember that yeah i mean who had the audacity to do that until nipsey hustle came through and did it you know it was unheard of <laughs> um but now everybody is doing you know they've taken a page from I didn't under when go ahead yeah. i didn't when you know, I didn't see the vision, right? When you hear it, all you hear is mixtape for a hundred dollars. <laughs> and you trying to figure out why is this mixtape a hundred dollars? What was the mindset behind it? The thought behind it, right? And that's what kind of turned me on to start really paying attention to who this guy was. I heard of Nipsey over the years, but I really just started paying attention to the Breakfast Club. Yeah. And that really just said, you know what? I'm gonna go get this album. I'm getting ready to I'm good that that interview made me go get that album and then i went like i said i went back and got the mm. entire catalog That's yeah no he was i mean he valued his work that much and he also knew that his hardcore fans valued his work that much they loved him so much you know and i don't think he was even offended that a lot of people didn't know him he he wanted to win people over but he understood he wasn't in it to be the most famous rapper you know he wanted to build a successful business and that meant like making a strong connection with each hardcore supporter. You know, he always said like he came up as everyone knows, you know, he was in the parking lot on Slauson and Crenshaw selling his CD hand to hand, you know? So that's why he was so committed to his community because they were the first to support him. And he always remembered that. And each of those new fans that he wanted, it could be in England or Eritrea and East Africa where his father was from. You know, he made fans all over the world and stayed in touch by social media and just built a strong fan base, not the biggest fan base, but the strongest one. So when it was time to say, okay, I've given you all this stuff for free. Here's my, you know, next big project. And, and his campaign was called Proud to Pay. <laughs> and they were proud to pay. They lined up around the block. You know, he made $100,000 that first pop-up shop in one night. I mean, and that just shows you the vision that he had and the, and the confidence that he had in himself. Yeah. Because most artists, I don't even think some of your, you know, your A-list artists would even go that far to have the guts to charge $100. But he knew, and that kind of value that Nipsey uh, had for him, not only himself, but into, into his craft and what he was doing. And more when I listened to this book, and I didn't know that he had the audio version. Yeah. So now that I had the audio version, I love audio books, so I've been listening uh, to no. it nonstop. Um, <laughs> one of the things I noticed in reading and then switching over to the audio version was, you know, Nipsey was an artist 
more of a community yeah. person more than almost an artist. Like he had a bigger vision for community and business than almost than he did as an artist. Is that well, fair I think to say? His music came first, but he leveraged the resources of the music to become a community activist. And he never lost his passion to make mm -hmm. great art, that's for sure. But he, he cared so much about the Crenshaw district, you know, where he was born and raised, you know, right in the heart of downtown L or not downtown, but you know, South Central LA as, as it's called today. Um, you know, this mm -hmm. is where the Rodney King uprising kicked off. And, you know, one of the most historic black communities in Los Angeles, you know, he was committed to the people who he grew up with there. And, and I think that had a special place in his heart. Um, and certainly his legacy in that area, I think will last as long as his music. If, you know, if we're, I, I wouldn't be able to choose one over the other, but both are very, very important to him. Now, was this book supposed to be released prior to Nipsey's passing? Um, I certainly started it before his passing. Um, there was no set release date on the books. You know, when I began, I just knew there was a need to tell his story properly. And, you know, as we mentioned, a lot of people kind of slept on him. Um, when I really, you know, when I finished my interview uh, around the Victory Lap, like you do interviews all the time and you know some of them are special. You know, you just can tell there's more to it than you expected right. going in. And, you know, having had a lot of history, um, you know, being aware of his music and tapping in with him at key moments in his career, I, I realized I, I felt a responsibility to tell this story properly. There weren't even that many magazine articles about him written during his career. You know, there, there was that one beautiful piece in GQ called California Love that focused on Nipsey and Lawrence's mm -hmm. relationship. But to really map out all of the things that he did for the music industry, for you know his community, just inspiring people all over the world, there was a lot that had to be told. So that was my inspiration. And I knew I couldn't fit that into a five minute video on YouTube. So I began researching and gathering information. You know? <laughs> and, and that over time, Right. And I believe there is a and I believe there's a huge excitement around this book because I think Nipsey fans have been waiting for something else. You know what I mean? Something to get more excited about. They have, you know, like whether it be a biopic, a book, something. So I believe this this is book is what fans have been waiting. I've been waiting on something and you provided that for them. Now when putting this book together, when you uh, this book did he seek you out or did you, this is just something that you just wanted to do on your own or how did that work? Um, how did that come no, about? This is something that I've done on my own as a music journalist. So it, it's not as if it was like a collaboration mm -hmm. of you know, like an official biography where sometimes an artist will work with a writer and you kind of co-write the project. That's not this book. Um, this is my mm -hmm. journalistic account placing him in the context of hip hop history in California history, in you know American history, because I think he is really one of the most important and misunderstood figures ever in hip hop, and so that was my my responsibility as a journalist to put it down because I saw it wasn't being done. Now, how long was this process of putting this piece together? Uh, about three years, all all told. Yeah, from I mean, you know. As I mentioned, mm. I had met him as early as 2009 and, you know, tapped in at a couple other points along the way, but it was really the Victory Lap album when I had that really in-depth conversation with him, which was February of 2018. And, you know, from that point on, you know, we did our short video on Mass Appeal YouTube, which was dope, but I was like, there's more that has to be done here. So I started researching him more, reaching out for other interviews and gathering material. I wasn't sure yet if I was going to do a documentary film or a book, but I knew it had to do, be like a long form project. And I eventually shifted more towards books just because 
I have experience writing books and you know, it allows you to kind of gather more material without flying all over the place with a camera crew. You can speak to people on the phone. You can speak to them on <laughs> Instagram or whatever the case is just to connect with the people you need to connect with. So, um, yeah, it was about three years and the book came out in March, you know, March 23rd of 2021. So, yeah. Okay. Now you mentioned, I know we just discussed kind of filming here. Um, is there a film you think you would put you or somebody into a film? I don't know about that, but I know that Nipsey's family is working on a documentary right now. So that will be their official project that I, I'm okay. sure will be amazing when it comes out. Um, I have been approached by people interested in um, adapting the book to a film, but I have no idea, you know, how when that'll happen, if that'll happen, that's a long way away. Right now, I'm just really focused on, um, you know, the book itself. And as you mentioned, there's been such a great response. Like, people really love Nipsey Hussle. And I think, you know, part of my inspiration also while finishing this book during, you know, the pandemic and the whole George Floyd situation, you know, the the racial reckoning that America is going through right now and the madness of the Trump years and everything. I just really felt like this book is something the world needs. You know, I think that Nipsey's philosophies and his example of bringing people together is important for everybody to know about. And um, so I'm very pleased. Like just today, I was um, able to announce that Howard University has invited me to take part in a conversation with the students of Howard and some of their professors about how hip hop artists like Nipsey Hussle can really help with racial justice and, you know, movements in, you know, to change the world. And I think those kinds of things need to be highlighted because, you know, those that knew Nip in, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of people slept on him, but those that knew him, some of them just had this like superficial concept of him as a kind of cliche gangster rapper, what have you. And, you know, obviously you've tapped in, you right. understand there's a lot more to him than that. It's one of the uh, biggest misconceptions other than that. What is the other biggest misconception of Nipsey Hussle? Yeah, I think just, you know, for those who have only a passing knowledge of him and just, you know, vaguely aware of, he was, you know, he was real, he was in the streets and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, first and foremost, Nipsey Hussle loved hip hop, you know, and he loved the fact that you could create something with your mind and your love of music and speak truth on a track and connect to people all over the world. And then benefit from that, you know, profit from that for the good of yourself and your family and your community. And he loved that so much and had a passion for it. And I think, you know, people that stereotype him as, you know, gangster rapper and so forth are really missing the big point, you know. Um, let's remember too that like this whole concept of gangs is something that I think in America we've been fed one idea from the media, you know, of, an image of gangsters and gangbangers that comes from movies and and music videos and when i was researching this book i learned about groups like you know the slossons who were a community organization you know before the black panthers before the crips and bloods you know this was a neighborhood organization that protected people from white gangs who were terrorizing black kids going to school there was there was a group called the spook hunters that nobody ever talks about you know, this is a white gang that had jackets, mm. which had, you know, like a, a, a cartoon of like a, a black person being lynched on their jacket. And they were cool with the police and they were out there terrorizing black families and, you know, kids going to school that walked through the wrong neighborhood. They would they would intimidate them. And, you know, so what is a real gang? You know, when we hear gang, we have an image of Crips and Bloods, but we don't know, you know, how that evolved. And I think Nipsey understood that history very well. He was very well read, 
you know, he although he did not complete high school, he was brilliant enough to like build his own computers and you know, do things that the average student could not do. And he knew the purpose and the real mission of these neighborhood organizations that came to be called gangs. And I think he was quietly working within the organization to kind of shift it back toward its original mission. And I believe that was his, his long-term vision for, for these groups. So, you know, that needs to be highlighted. And, um, you know, I, I've tried to do that in, in the book. Well, I would I would definitely tell you I've not um, completed it yet, but the very, very detail for people who love detail and it yeah. loved it. It's excellent, excellent. It's very Thank detailed, you. and I love detail. I, I love somebody that can paint a picture for me and break that. Oh yeah, and it, but when I when somebody can break it down and, and paint a picture very vividly, I love that. I can see everything that you're saying in this in this book. Uh, that's really great. Uh, every, you know, everybody that works on something, whether you're a writer or a filmmaker or interviewer, you want people to experience it after you put work in, you want to put it out in the world and let them, you know, soak it up and, and talk about it and have a conversation. So I love hearing from you, you know, your impressions and things you like about it. Um, you know, they say God is in the details and, you know, I definitely, that's that's my process as a journalist. It always has been to like gather as much information as possible. And I'll tell you, the, the book is 400 pages. It could have easily been 600 pages. I have a lot more material, a lot of notes and research. And as you saw that in the back, there's like hundreds of footnotes. So, you know, I tried to really um, do my homework and talk to as many people as I could and, and get as many voices in this as possible. Because there's going to be people who might pick this book up because they love Nip's music or they just admire him, but maybe they didn't know the history of, you know, the Slawsons or they don't know about redlining and restrictive covenants and how, you know, families were prevented from living in different parts of Los Angeles because they came from, you know, black heritage. Like right. these things need to be, highlighted and you know some of that I didn't know myself when, until I was researching the book so my hope my goal is to kind of make the book like a Trojan horse and you put a lot of info in there that people might not even you know sign up for but you know as they're learning about NIP they're also learning about the history of Los Angeles and segregation and how racism works and what gangs really are and you know what Trump was really about and all these kind of things as well as just you know, most importantly, Nip's own inspirational, you know, the game that he wanted to give to, to everybody that would listen. You know, that was the biggest thing that he, I admired about him. And I, the last question I asked, actually, during our interview, I said, you know, I admire the fact that you share all of your secrets for success in your music and your interviews. And do you never feel like you don't want to you know, do you want to hold it back or why is it so important to you to share everything the way you do? And he said, look, I'm not outside giving out bags of money, but the game is free. You know, and, and when I was a kid coming up, that's all we hope that the older hustlers would, would share with us. Just give us the game. You know, you don't have to tell us all your secrets, but give us the game and give us a chance to follow in your footsteps. And if you don't, it's almost like you're a hater. It's almost like you're trying to block people from progressing. Right. So if you're secure in your own ability to hustle, you don't mind giving up game. And and so Nipsey definitely wanted to share his secrets and his insights and the ways that he had advanced himself to anyone that would listen. And the, this book, The Marathon Don't Stop, is my attempt to pass on the game that I've seen, that I've soaked up in talking to Nip and studying his work and, you know, passing it on. Um, what was something that surprised you about Nipsey in your time of knowing him? Well, I have to say the fact that he built his own computer. I knew he was brilliant, but <laughs> to be able to sit down with a bunch of parts and he literally read it in a magazine, you know, like there was a computer, 
you know, basically, let's call it what it is, a computer nerd magazine, right? People that get into that mm -hmm. that level who can read an article and take the parts and like go look for, oh, I just need this one memory chip and I need the, the keyboard and I put it all together and he would bring the parts home, you know, and I mean, to think of someone to be able to do that is mind blowing. Um, another thing that I learned working on the book, which was quite breathtaking to me is everybody knows the, the record dedication, right? With um, Nipsey and Kendrick Lamar. All right. On that record, he says, um, Tupac of my generation, he compares himself to Pac. So when I interviewed mm -hmm. him, of course, I had to ask that question. You know, that's a big statement. Like, you're comparing yourself to Tupac right. Shakur. You know, what was your thought process there? And he said that he felt as though, you know, Tupac was kind of a Trojan horse, to use that term again. He, he had more inside him, more intellect and more intelligence than he would show everybody you know that thug life image kind of you know concealed some of his deep wisdom and um he felt as though it, what what nip said is in our culture street culture intelligence is often viewed as a form of weakness and so you don't want to show that you're smart because you look weak and maybe people don't respect you as much and so you kind of hold it back a little bit and nipsey said he could relate to that he could relate to that feeling and that was one of the reasons that he compared himself to Pac. but then i learned so this is what blew me away and i bet you got to this part of the book already but when he was not even called nipsey hustle yet he was rapping under the name of concept in his early early career him and rallo styles mm -hmm who was his high school classmate, made a record that found its way to the attention of the late Afeni Shakur, rest in peace, you know, Tupac's mother, member of the Black Panther Party, um, you know, just a very powerful figure in, in American history. And she heard this record by this artist that she had never, you know, she didn't know who Concept was, and he wasn't even called Nipsey Hussle yet, but she wanted him and Rallo and the other artists that were on the record with them to fly to Atlanta for a Tupac Shakur uh, tribute album launch event. So that he performed, he, you know, before he was called Nipsey Hustle, him and Rallo flew from LA to Atlanta. A Fanny Shakur picked them up in a van from the airport and drove them to this release party for the album Better Days, which was a Tupac album that came out after his passing and right. it just blows my mind that like Pac's mother was impressed with young Aramis Askadome's raps to the point that she wanted him to come perform at a Tupac launch event like so when he says Tupac of my generation you know there's a lot behind it and it's a it's a crazy story to me I, that blew me away from your from your perspective uh, what were some of the similarities between Nipsey and Tupac? Because you've been around since you've been around, right? You've seen yeah, all the yeah. different eras. You, you've been around. So, what, in your opinion, uh, what are some of the similarities between Nipsey and Tupac? Well, there's a record right now um, that Big Sean put out um, where he call, he talks about, you know, Nip has a verse on there where he talks about, you know, fuck rap, I'm a street legend. The block loved me with a deep reverence. And I think that's the same way, mm. you know, people think of Tupac. There's a reverence around him. The love for him is different than just your favorite rapper, you know, because he was a spokesperson right. for justice and, you know, not, not taking, you know, injustice lying down. He would stand up and speak truth to power and, you know, um, Tupac didn't live as long on earth as Aramis Askadome. And I think, you know, Aramis, or that's Nipsey's born name, you know, Nipsey had more time on earth to put these philosophies into practice, you know, and he was, you know, both of them were very much aware of the work of the Black Panthers and, you know, just the struggle for liberation and justice, social justice. Um, but, you know, I think because Aramis Askadome, Nipsey Hussle had more time on earth, 
he was able to put more things into practice, you know, um, and that that would be the main difference. But you know, they're they're obviously they're unique individuals. Each of them has their own um, attributes. I think you know Nipsey was born in the midst of Los Angeles and was really a part of that street culture for most you know a large part of his life and you know whereas Tupac kind of came to it late um but you know they're both artists who people love so much and that's the biggest similarity with your experience um at Vibe uh, up until now how have you seen hip-hop evolve wow that's a great question and a big one um I think when Vibe was first coming out, people actually, you know, there were, okay, so you know, it was Quincy Jones who started Vibe with Time Inc., which is a major magazine book publishing company. And the people at Time Inc. had never done anything like Vibe, you know, it was a rap magazine, you know, backed by Quincy Jones. You know, the first issue, we had Tretch from Naughty by Nature, and then we had Snoop Dogg, you know, on the next cover, and Wesley Snipes. It was, it was a different thing for timing. And when they uh, were trying to, you know, put that project together, there were people at Time Inc. that said, well, do hip hop fans even read? Like, is there going to be, you know, a market for, for this kind of a thing? And obviously we know the vibe shifted culture, it shifted the whole perception of hip hop. You know, we were the first magazine to endorse Barack Obama for president. Um, you know, we did so many things to kind of present hip hop with the great photography and the great journalism and, you know, just respectfully yes. like, present it on the highest level. And so I think that's the biggest change that I've seen. And, you know, fast forward to 2021, hip hop is by far the most popular genre of music in the world, you know, and it affects everything from fashion to, you know, the whole media space, like all the new social networks when they come out, like Clubhouse, where would Clubhouse be without hip hop? The only thing you hear about is which hip hop mm. artist, which hip hop exec is on the new, you know, and the same for all these social media technology companies, you know, the value and this is something that Nipsey articulated very clearly in many interviews. The value of these companies comes from the, the celebrities who are using it because that's what attracts the audience, right? So if, if Diddy has 10 million followers right. and, you know, Nipsey has however many, like everybody together, is, you know, the, the power of hip hop is what makes Instagram valuable or Twitter valuable, you know? Um, and so I think what we've seen over time is for the the artists and the creators to start to realize their value and start to claim it and control it and want to own a piece of their own value. And Nipsey was way ahead of his time in seeing that and understanding it and, and again, giving out the game to, to make every rapper know you're worth more than you realize. You don't have to sign this OK mm -hmm. contract that the label is trying to get you to sign. And you don't have to necessarily, you know, give interviews to everyone. You can decide what you, you know, where you endorse things and how you endorse things and eventually leverage that to your benefit. So, you know, hip hop is such an awesome force and thank God for hip hop, honestly, because I think mm -hmm. it has the power to save America. Now you've been, like I said earlier, you've been through pretty much every era of hip hop. And you think almost you've probably seen it all. How has COVID changed the industry in your in your opinion forever? Well, I definitely wasn't around for every era, but I came to New York in the late eighties and so you know that was when I tapped in. But of course hip hop goes back way before I ever came on the scene. But you know, during the time that I've been engaged with it and really paying attention everybody knows that COVID changed the world, you know, like we've never had a time where people had to stay indoors for when, when it was first announced, they were saying we might have to be locked down for two months, three months. And now it's been a year and we're still 
going through this, we're still trying to get, you know, the, the straight information about, you know, what is this vaccine and, you know, will it protect us? How long will it last? Will it have side effects? You know, and for artists, obviously, it's been a huge challenge because you can't get out there and touch your audience. You can't perform live. You can't go out and right. that tour money stuff you know so people who have been able to adapt and do things like what we're doing today like have an internet or digital interaction and share stuff uh online are are the ones who are moving forward right now so you saw like swizz and timbaland with the verses you know that was a game changer d nice with the club quarantine you know just djing on instagram you know it's, it's the innovative mindset that is moving ahead right now and I, i'm quite sure if nip was here he would have been coming up with something creative to you know make the most of this moment and um you know we see some of his uh you know protégés some of the artists that came up with him who are definitely doing cool things you know following his playbook people like cousin capone and jay stone and you know pac-man they're all doing you know, the proud to pay models and the, you know, like dropping mixtapes and interacting with people on social media. So, you know, the game always continues. Hip hop cannot be stopped. COVID is not going to stop it, but it's a big challenge for sure. And I know we're all looking forward to going back out into the world, going to a hip hop jam. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> oh my God. Cannot wait. So. So where are you based? Are you based? What inspired in, uh, you to become a writer? Oh, to become a writer! Wow. Um, I'm in, I'm in Indianapolis. Are you in Indianapolis? Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, like, what's what's the yeah. But I come out to California all the time. Do you? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, being a writer has been something that I just knew I was going to do. Like, my my dad was an English professor. Um, and so I grew up with books in the house and, uh, I was an English major when I went to college. Uh, and my goal was to work at Rolling Stone. I, I, I knew I loved music and I love words and writing and telling stories. So, you know, I tried to get down with Rolling Stone cause that was like the only magazine that I knew that was doing something close to what I wanted to do, but I had other music that I wanted to highlight. And, um, then when I was unsuccessful at doing that. I ended up working at an art magazine and just learned about publishing and learned about how to report and edit and put a magazine together. And then when I heard about Vibe in 92, I just zeroed in on it. Sometimes you just know this is the thing that I've been waiting for. And I was bombarding them with letters every week. I would, and this was letters now with a stamp and an envelope mailing them off and uh they received a lot of letters from me until they gave me a shot and um that first story i did was about super cat the jamaican dancehall artist who is one of my favorites of all time yeah i remember that yeah 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 so super cat i always say i owe my career to cat because you know that story was kind of you know a mind-blowing story you know his whole movement was so crazy and he was so influential for like young Puff Daddy and Heavy D collabing with him and stuff. So that got me on. And then from 93, I joined the startup team of Vibe. And 17 years later, you know, uh, we had done a lot. You know, but there was no looking back once I got down with Vibe. What are one of the things you're most proud of about this book? The biggest thing for me is something that we've touched on already is just that you know there's been so much love around the book people have been waiting as you mentioned to express their their you know adoration for nipsey and i think it is exciting to see the response like on social media if you go on my ig which is at robert j kenner go in the stories and you know how like when you do a lot of story posts that little line at the top gets real small right i've seen it i saw it today I was bugging out, man. Like the first few days, I couldn't believe it. I had to have help. I had a good friend help me out with managing the social, kind of a, you know, someone that does it 
professionally and knows how to do it because I couldn't keep up with it all, you know. And it's just been overwhelming the love that has come out for for Nip. And I guess the other thing that I'm proud of is that voices are in this book who haven't necessarily been heard from before, you know, because I think his story was kind of underground to the mainstream media and off the radar. I wasn't um, seeing voices like Dexter Brown spoken about or Young Gooch, the one who gave Nipsey his rap name. Um, you know, even Cousin Capone, who was kind of a big homie to Nip in street life and music when he was just starting out. You had you weren't hearing from these these voices. And so by being able to showcase them in a book, I'm I'm proud of that because I feel like we're setting the record straight. It's not just the industry version. You know, the people obviously once Nip became famous right. Signed with Rock Nation, got down with Atlantic Records. We know he won a Grammy with DJ Khaled. We know that he made a classic with Hip Boy. And, you know, that stuff is very important. But I think it's also important to know when he had just been asked to leave high school and he was trying to survive in the streets. This guy from Trinidad moved into Los Angeles named Dexter Brown. And Dexter Brown takes him in and gives him access to music equipment 24 7. And he got busy and that was where like some of his first projects were recorded right in Dexter's house. And, you know, that's where he got the name Nipsey Hussle. So that part of the story has never been told or if anyone knew it, they, they never wrote about it. And that makes me proud that I can share the truth about, you know, Nip's early days and how he became the legend that we know. All right. Congratulations on the book. Um, the book is available. I believe it's available everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. Um, there's a link in my bio for all the different ways you could be in India, Australia, UK, Canada. Like, there's a link <laughs> for every part of the world. Um, and then, yeah, as you mentioned, there's a digital, um, you know, you can get an ebook, audio, or the hardcover. So, you know, and we're doing this talk at Howard University on April 12th. So everybody can register for that. Um, the link is also in my bio and that's going to be real cool. So I hope everybody will, you know, tap in to that conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate yeah. you. Appreciate the platform. Thank you. And I thank you for, uh, I know you're busy. I know you probably got a ton of interviews to do, and I just want to thank you for taking time out to speak with to my audience about, uh, about Nipsey's book and as well. Um, so I, I appreciate it, man. I can't wait to finish this book. I'm going to hit you up and just give you more of my opinion. But uh, like I told Please. you, it's very detailed, and that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. And, you know, I, I, I respect what you're doing, like I said, off top. You know, you're building your own platform, doing your own thing. And, you know, I've been on Good Morning America and a lot of other cool programs. But... I, I respect and appreciate what you're doing a, a whole bunch. So, you know, keep it going. Wake up! God damn it.